Hi, my name is Vincent Patterson. I'm a director and a choreographer, and I've worked with people like Michael Jackson and Madonna. And this is my interview with Red Jackson. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome everyone, I'm Red Jackson and today I have the honour of being joined by the legendary Vincent Patterson. How are you today Vincent? Oh, I'm a little frustrated that the internet didn't work at the beginning but I'm much happier now and nice to be talking to you. So thank you so much for coming onto the channel, I mean it's a real pleasure to have the chance to talk with you. I have so much I'd like to ask you. So you've had such an extensive and an incredible career. So can you just tell my viewers a bit about who you are and what you've done in your career? Wow. Well, um, I can talk about it in general, but that's a very long question. Um, yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a director and I'm a choreographer. I began as, um, as an actor and a stage director and when I was younger. And um, then I, in my early 20s, I got into dancing and I danced and then I wanted to be on the other side of the camera so I began to choreograph yeah. and eventually went back to directing again both theater and so many from um, music videos and commercials and short films and um, things like that so and now I'm an author so I've kind of touched a lot of lot of little yeah places and uh, and enjoyed myself in every little new costume I put on well, that's excellent. And I can't wait to delve into some of your works. But first, you mentioned that you started dance in your 20s, which is relatively later in life than many of your contemporaries. Did that sort of present any challenges to you? Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I was um, I was not athletic. As I said, I was an actor. So I was kind of a theater mole, so to speak. And um, I, I, I just wasn't at athletic and one time I, I had moved to Tucson, Arizona and I passed this dance studio every day and I heard this music and I thought oh, let me open the door and see what's going on in there so I did and there were young girls in there doing ballet and I thought hmm maybe this is a good exercise and the teacher said can I help you I said well do you have dance classes for somebody like me and she said well all we teach her is ballet and we don't really have adult classes but and I don't think you should take them if you're just starting but I have classes where you can join the girls that are say 10 to 13 or 14 and I said all right I'll try that I was about close to 24 years old I had no idea how difficult it was going to be I worked like a crazy person, Red. I, I, I walked around with a broomstick under my arms to pull my back, my back up and open my chest. I carried a bookcase, like a, a big Coke bottle, empty Coke bottle that was filled with sand that I would take out whenever I could take my shoes off and roll my feet to kind of try to get some nice arches. And yeah. um, I had a big telephone book in there, really thick telephone book. And I would sit on it and stretch as much as I could. I couldn't touch my toes. I could barely touch my knees, you know, to be honest with you. Yeah. So it was about really recreating a new body and yeah. it was painful and euphoric at the same time mm. uh to see the change was enlightening and inspiring for me and i grew kind of quickly i guess in one way i was always supposed to be involved in dance and i never knew it but on the other hand i had this little trick that i used because i was in the theater and i knew how to act 
I went to the library and I got some books out on like Nureyev and um, mostly Nureyev images. And every time I would go into class, I would say, okay, today you are Prince Igor, blah, 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 or you're the prince from Sleeping Beauty or whatever. So even though I couldn't really dance yet, I could put on a character. Yeah. And through that character, I really feel it developed my dance um, right. abilities much, much more quickly than it would have if I hadn't done it that way. Wow. Now, as a dancer, you starred in one of my favorite music videos, Lionel Richie's Dancing on the Ceiling. I mean, it's uh, such a feel-good song. Uh, How challenging was it to sort of dance on the ceiling? Was a gimbal stuff used? Yes, it was a gimbal. Uh, Michael Peters choreographed it, and um, it was really fun, especially I, I got to, I was kind of doubled out. There was another guy and myself who kind of were supposed to be like Lionel's backup players, yeah. and we had really fun uh, time, and we got to go in the gimbal, gimbal together and play, and it was very strange at first, yeah. very disorienting. And um, But after a couple minutes, you kind of got used to it, and it was interesting and fun, and what you don't realize is the room just moves around and you basically stay where you are and the room keeps coming around you. And when I first saw it, I thought, how the heck am I going to do that? I'm supposed to go upside down. How does it work? You know, I thought it was all about strings and, 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 and harnesses or something that maybe they would CGI out, but no, it was basically you kind of did your thing and the room moved all around you. And it was an, it was a very fun video with a lot of dear friends of mine and, or anything with Michael Peters was just such a joy to participate in. Oops, yeah, yeah. Now, you've also worked extensively with the iconic Madonna on projects mm -hmm. as the Blonde Ambition Tour, performances of Vogue, the Express Yourself video, but you also worked on Evita. Now, I've heard that Madonna was pregnant during filming, so how did that affect the choreography? Um, well, she didn't know she was first we shot a lot in argentina buenos aires yeah. and that was predominantly the interior shots um when we went for exteriors argentina buenos aires has beautiful old classic buildings but right next to them are huge glass skyscrapers so we couldn't shoot exteriors there so we went to budapest well when just before we got to Budapest, I got a call from Madonna telling me that she found out she was pregnant and she had a little belly. And um, I said, OK, well, I'm, I'll change choreography and do all of this for you. And she said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't change too much. You know, let me see how much I can do at first. Yeah. And if it won't work, then we can change things. And she really loved what I had created originally. So the predominance of what we shot first when she was pregnant was um, the sort of fantasy near the end with Antonio Banderas, you know, and that was the one that made her no most nervous because she had a very clingy white dress on, almost like a slip, yeah. and you could see her belly a little bit if you know about it, but I wanted to change a few things, and she said, no, don't do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dance it. I feel fine, and I said, okay. Then we went to London, and we filmed... Um, the the piece in the in the club you know yeah. buenos aires blah, blah, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. and again i had some lifts in there little lifts and things and she said no vincent don't change it i feel okay i feel okay but i was prepared i'm always prepared and uh you know we have to always be prepared yeah. for crazy things like that and but it all went great it all went really well yeah of course i mean you did so much with madonna it's incredible i mean do you have a project you did with her that you're most proud of? Well, you know, I the truth is I I put myself a thousand percent into every project I do, whether it's a tiny little project or a huge project. But I I have to say my two favorite projects. Um, the first was the Blonde Ambition Tour because I got to change with Madonna. We got to change the face of pop musicals what they were all about what pop tours were about and yeah. nobody had ever done what we did and we changed it we we just changed it with one tour the blonde ambition tour and i'm so proud of the work especially because 
she had hired somebody else originally and it didn't work out. And um, she called me up. She had originally asked me and then thought she was going to be, let me see, how could I say this nicely? More interesting and thought she'd go another way with a um, uh, more of a company modern ballet choreographer. It didn't work out. So she called me at the last minute and said, I need you to save my ass. I need you to save my ass. And so I said, okay, I'm, it's going to be tough. I've got what, 21 days to do 18 entire pieces oh, wow. and one week. Oh yeah. And one week, I think one week, maybe a week and a half to tech it before we went. So I just, my heart just overflows when I think of how we all work together as a team, all the dancers and Madonna, I, I'm Madonna as well, and Donna and Nikki, her backup singers, and and the band as well. But, um, you know, I came in, I changed the, the song list, what we were going to do, changed the order and all of that. And so that was really my fam favorite favorite yeah. participation with Madonna. But I'm also really proud of the MTV 10th anniversary with her as Marie Antoinette, because it was such an original idea and I'm so happy. And she was a little resistant at first, but it just turned out to be iconic. It, and it, it, I'm really happy, really proud of that. Now let's move on to discuss your outstanding work with the King of Pop, Michael Jackson. You oh, were on the thriller and beat it short films. Did you ever think they'd become so iconic and popular? Did you, how did they compare to other projects you'd worked on? Well, there actually was no comparison, Red, because MTV was just beginning. There was nothing like MTV. There hadn't been anything like MTV. Mm -hmm. So the funny thing was when we did, I mean, Michael had done Billie Jean and it had some success and then Beat It came about and I auditioned and got the role of the white gang leader. And um, I got to be Michael Peter's assistant choreographer as well. So it was just a joy to see Michael Jackson at the beginning of his solo career, truly, and, and, and watch him over almost 20 years of collaboration, you know, to see what happened. But when Beat It happened, we had no idea that it was going to be viral. There was no thing as viral. It didn't exist yet. You know, computers didn't exist, but it was viral before we knew what viral was. And so we were blown away. And then when Thriller happened, oh my God, you know, when it began even with John Landis directing and Michael Peters choreographing again, and I assisted again and was a zombie in that, um, we had a little more inkling that maybe this was going to be pretty incredible. And then to see what happened then, and even to today, that people still do this dance, I mean, it's pretty shocking. Yeah. Um, so proud of being involved in those two projects. But um, yeah, originally to answer that question, nothing to compare it to. Yeah. Nothing. We were setting the stage for a whole new way of looking at dance and listening to music or looking at music actually so i mean michael sort of invented viral in a way but he yeah. became viral before it was a thing and <laughs> exactly. it sort of an event weren't they i mean yeah nothing. yeah oh I, I i i people stayed home people waited i mean there were announcements when these were going to happen especially thriller and you know i mean people waited and waited for it all over the world no matter what time of day or night it was airing for the yeah. first time it was absolutely incredible absolutely incredible now you worked on smooth criminal too which is one of my personal favorites so oh, how was the lean conceptualized and brought to fruition i'm not going to tell you that because that's a, I'm going to leave that for my book, um, because everybody asked me that question. And for all these years, I've kind of kept it a secret. Yeah. Um, I will say when we put it into the tour, we did it a completely different way. We did it with um, shoes that slid into a sl metal slot that yeah. was inside the stage floor, uh, which is not how we did it when we shot the short film. Yeah. But uh, um, I'm that little secret for people to find out in my book <laughs> but smooth criminal i'm telling you smooth criminal for me 
When Michael Jackson once told me that Smooth Criminal was his favorite short film, I said to him, I thought it was Thriller. And he said, oh, no, 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 Vince. No, no, no. I love Thriller. I love Beat It. I loved everything I've done. But Smooth Criminal is my favorite yeah. piece. And when you think about it and you look back, the amount of information or or, or elements from Smooth Criminal that he carried on for the rest of his career, mm-hmm. you know, the armband, the 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 band-aids on the fingers, the so many things, the the the, the fedoras, you know, that he had done in black, but he wanted to do in white and just so much stuff, even some of the movement that he continued to carry on. I can understand now why he had said to me that um that this was his favorite short film. And of course, that filled me with incredible delight. Of course. Smooth Criminal sort of, it's almost as though it inspired Dangerous and the Dangerous performances. You can sort of see the similarities between them. I mean, there's nothing like Smooth Criminal. It's got to be one of his best. Thanks. I, 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 We all enjoyed it and it was an amazing experience. And I was a little bit disappointed to see Dangerous, to be honest with you. It looked a little bit like a mini ripoff, you know, and I I, I was a little disappointed in that. Um, But nothing could take the place of Smooth Criminal. Um, I mean, it took, we had almost a month of rehearsal where Michael kept adding dancers for me. He was shooting his, he was creating his album. And um, so he would say, oh, just cast people and do what you want. And I would shoot it and come and show him. And he would say, I think you need more, more people, don't you? And I say, yeah, and go back and show him more. I think you need more people, don't you? Yeah, Mike. I go back. I think you need more people. I mean, I think we had like 50 some yeah. people, 50 some actors, dancers by the wow. end. And he even said one day when I was over at his house and we're looking at the, at the footage and he said, I think we need a second floor, don't you? And I said, Sure. Yeah. Why not? So, I mean, (laughs) it was amazing as a creator to just have anything you visualize in your head come to life, you know, and um, and he was the one that made it happen. So I'm grateful, so grateful to have had that opportunity. Now, when you cast dancers for projects such as Smooth Criminal, what are you looking for in them as a choreographer? What do you what do you look for? Well, it's interesting, you know, of course, I look at the dance first. Yeah. It's important to me that people can um, mimic or copy the movements that I create and, and can really dance them in a way that makes me feel satisfied with the creation. But having been a director and being a director, ultimately, I look to see what dancers can also be actors, which dancers can help me tell my story because that was that's the way I choreograph I'm story oriented whether it's abstract or non-abstract or linear I still go after story and in fact uh interesting point once I hired these dancers I made them do exercises that I do with actors I had them each do a bio a short bio of the character name themselves give themselves a character name for inside the club and then write a bio about that character and how did they relate to other people in the club. And also when we shot, of course, there's no fourth wall. I would make everybody walk in the green door and for the whole rehearsal. And when they were in there, they had to be addressed by their character names. And then when we finished the rehearsal, even for a 10 minute break, they would come out of the green door and go back to being themselves. But I think the payoff for this is Mm -hmm. If you look at any shot in that short film, any close-up of anybody, you see story going on. You don't see just a dancer getting ready to do their next dance step. It's like a movie. It's truly like a movie, you know. And this was a new experience for a lot of the dancers. They had never worked that way. And now a lot of my assistants who had worked with me over the years have now gone on to, in their own work, do employ those same exercises for dancers so that they can get a much more rich performance out of them. Fascinating. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Now, how did working with Michael on projects such as Blood on the Dance Floor in the 90s compare to working with him in the 80s? What were the similarities and differences? Well, the similarities were 
all positive. They were that it was Michael Jackson. <laughs> and I knew whatever happened, it was going to be brilliant. Um, the, uh, the difference was, Michael, this was close to 15, 17 years later than when I had first begun to work with him. Well, you can imagine any of us when we begin a career and we're stepping into something, everything is fresh and new and sparkly and, 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 and exciting. And, you know, and after you've been doing this for close to 20 years, not only does do you get a little bit drained, right. but you're constantly hounded by everybody, not only press and people like this, but but the people that need you on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, your publicists, your, your managers, you're this, you're that, you're that. So where at the beginning, Michael was never distracted because this was all new to him and it was new to everybody surrounding him. Yeah. But by the time we got to Blood on the Dance Floor, one of the things I said to him when he called me was, Mike, I'll do this, but you know, the last time we did a little project together, I had a hard time with you showing up on time, you know, and... <laughs> will you do it and he promised me he would and one time he didn't and i had to scold him but after that he was a good boy and he didn't get a spanky as madonna you said used to say and then the fun thing was on our last day of shooting prince was about to be born so he was like i had to really rush through directing those shots because he said i'm gonna have a baby i'm gonna have a baby and so we all screamed and congratulated him yep. and off he went and that was the last day of our shoot before we continue with the interview, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, MJ Market. Michael Jackson Market is a business created by passionate fans who believe that all collectors should have access to rare and unique items at a great price. They source their items from all over the world so that you don't have to, and they provide a great buying experience. So if you want any type of Michael Jackson memorabilia, whether it's clothing or books or magazines, go to michaeljacksonmarket.com for the best quality at the best price. You can also check them out on Instagram, at Michael Jackson Market. Thank you once again to Michael Jackson Market for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the interview. Now, what does dance mean to you? Wow. <laughs> well, I think First, it means joy. I think that, you know, I never watched dance. I never was interested in dance. So it wasn't some, I mean, I danced, you know, at high school and all that, just regular dancing at club, you know, in, in high school dances and things like that. But I, I never had any formal training. And I grew up really in the suburbs along the Delaware River, which was kind of like Liverpool, where I grew up. So there, you know, it was a real working class environment. There were no dance companies. There were no dance schools. So I never really saw, even saw formal dance. Yeah. Um, but once I began to experience it, I think the greatest revelation for me was pre-dancing, I used to see the world just through here, just through my eyes like this. When I started to dance, I felt three-dimensional. I yeah. felt my whole body moving through space all the time. And that was the biggest difference. That was truly the biggest difference of how you're physically, this, this thing that we live inside, this casement, whatever we want to call it, how it's capable of doing things that you never had any idea you could do until you put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. And when you do it, the endorphins that run through your body make you feel so high and bring you so much joy and so much positivity that you wind up hopefully pushing that out into the world, you know, kind of like a, there's so much negativity out there that if you can put some positive energy and let it just kind of ripple across the pond, um, then I think you're really taking dance and using it in all the ways yes. that it can manifest itself. So, yeah, I think so. I, I enjoyed being a dancer so much. It was so difficult and to keep it up, even all the time I was working as well. Uh, I would continue to take class for hours and hours every day. And I really, really, really loved it. So, um, 
anybody who has any inkling to try, I, I just say, go for it. Just go for it. It will change your life. It will really change your life. Yeah. I mean, dance is incredible. There's just, there's no thing oh. like it. It's, it's incredible. Truly. As a choreographer, do you ever get like a choreographer's equivalent of a writer's block? Is it ever challenging to keep producing original work? Well, I'm a research freak, you know, so I, I've never really had writer's block, so to speak, um, for many reasons. One, because I love to read, I love to, I, I, all my life, once I started this profession, I, I, I'm going through magazines, I see something that's an in, interesting image, I'll rip it out and put it, you know, in files and, yeah. you know, something comes up, a job comes to me and I'm, it has to do with vegetables, who knows, you know, I, I, I go back and I look through all my stuff and I see what images I have about vegetables and that excites me and something winds up going crazy in my head. Um, jumping back to the Blonde Ambition Tour, for instance, having 21 days to do 18 songs. I was like, how am I going to do this? What I would do is I would take the song, I would put it into uh, uh, cassette tapes. That's what we used in those ancient days, cassettes. And, <laughs> and I would, before I went to bed, before I fell asleep, I would lay in bed and I, would, I had recorded it on a loop like 20 or 30 times each song. So I would just take the song I was going to do the next day and I would listen to it for 20, 30 times and I would just be ready to fall asleep. I would take my headphones off. I would wake up in the morning and the dance was in front of my eyes. I mm. swear to you, this is the way it went. Not every step, but the dance. I would go in to the rehearsal working with uh, two of my assistants, Kevin Stay and uh, Smith Wordies, who's unfortunately no longer with us, but, um, and I would teach it to them. And as I did, I would get specific about everything. And I would have the whole dance within another hour and a half before the dancers and the singers came in, showed it to them. And then Madonna would come in and we would put the whole piece together in that day. And the next day, the first thing we would do is review what we did the day before and learn a whole new, new dance. Wow. So wow. it was, um, I can't say I've ever had writer's block. I, I've always been inspired, but I've always been so full fortunate with so many wonderful projects being handed to me whether it was commercials or film or tv or short films or videos you know i i always had great projects handed to me and for that i'm so grateful Gosh. what guides you is it the music or the instrumentation or is it more the storyline what sort of helps you create the choreography what do you base it off um it depends on it depends on the genre in which I'm working. So creating something for a 30 second commercial is very different than creating something for tour or creating something for a short film, obviously. Um, so inspiration comes in different ways. I mean, when you're creating for a commercial, you have to realize that you might have three seconds to make movement that somehow is gonna be impactful. Yeah. You know, so in those situations, I don't usually go for story. I go for movement that will boom pop off the screen, you know. In other cases, I usually like to be dominated by story. However, Michael Jackson once said to me, and I will never ever um, stop working this way. When he first asked me to do Smooth Criminal, and I thought he gave me a cassette. Uh, I went to his studio where he was recording and he gave me a little cassette when I left. And I said, do you want me to listen to this and, and, and dance in the, the short film? And he said, no, Vincent, I want you to take it. I want you to, I want you to not put your vision on any of the music. I want you to let the music talk to you and tell you what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to choreograph it and direct it. Well, I didn't get to direct it, but I did choreograph it. And that's the way I started to work forever. I mean, I listened to it about, I don't even know, a hundred times. I was so nervous, of course, my first project with him as a choreographer. And I called him up and I said, this is what I think. It may be like a underground club in the thirties. And, you know, I know you like Fred Astaire and 
I know you like that kind of sense of drama, and I think we could really do something fantastic with that. And he loved it. So I kind of use that method whenever I choreograph. I just sit and, as I did with Madonna, like I said, I let the music tell me what it wants to be. And then I feel like I take those images and I translate them right. into physicality. Oh. So that's how we that's do it. Interesting. Was this smooth criminal like the whole idea for the club? Was that all yours? Did you oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every, the whole entire thing was mine. Everything was mine. And in fact, unfortunately for me, I didn't get to direct it because it became part of Moonwalker. It wasn't supposed to be originally. It was only supposed to be Smooth Criminal as a short film. But when it became part of Moonwalker, um, the producers hired uh, a different producer. Whole, whole, everything changed. The uh, whole new string of producers came in. They felt that they needed to get a film director who had a lot of credit, a lot of special effects background. Uh, so Colin Chilvers came in. But the beautiful thing for me is he was very respectful of what of my work. And Michael had given me a camera and I shot all of my rehearsals and I had basically storyboarded it from beginning to end. So when Colin came in, I sat down with him and I showed him my whole visual storyboard and showed him a lot of what I had recorded. And he was so positive and he was like, well, man, this is basic yours so you know you're going to be with me through this whole thing and we put it together and there was nothing that he changed mm. from what i had originally created um the only thing that that i had not created this was crazy michael's idea was the gangster up on the top level who he shoots and goes into the wall yeah. and pff, yeah. becomes a, 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 a like a piece of graffiti on the wall you know uh that was his crazy idea but everything else was was me everything else was mine. wow now, how did your new autobiography come about? Is it something you've always wanted to do? And how did you feel looking back over your whole career? Um, well, first, I want to jump back for a second, Red, okay? I want, to, I want to add that, you know, Michael had asked me if he could bring in a, a choreographer who had done a lot of street choreography and that he had worked with sometimes on the weekends to you know, he, he would work with street guys yeah. to learn that technique and learn what was happening out there. And so he brought in, he asked me if it was okay to bring in Jeffrey Daniel. And I said, absolutely. So Jeffrey came in and he brought in about seven guys who were it was not it was early hip hop. It wasn't quite hip hop yet. It was more street and pop and rock and all of that, you know? So I don't want to dismiss Jeffrey's contribution because he made a beautiful contribution to Smooth Criminal. So I just wanted to add that. Um, so it wasn't all me. Jeffrey had a really nice finger in the pot. My autobiography. I, I never thought about writing. The only time I had ever written was in a lot of my work, I traveled all over the world. And I always did it alone. I was rarely ever invited to bring a co-choreographer or an assistant. So I did it all myself. And I would sometimes hire assistants in different countries if I needed them. So I got lonely. I'm a real people person. And I would start to write journals. And um, I would then send those, you know, send letters off to friends until computers came about. And then I would write my journals daily. But I never thought about writing a book or anything like this. And then what happened was a Swedish documentarian, Shesti Gundrich, did a um, documentary on me. Um, it was called The Man Behind the Throne. And it was originally for Swedish TV, but then it aired um, all over the world. And she won a lot of awards. And um, it, it, was a, it was difficult for me to do because I... I've always been the man behind the throne, you know, I never did publicity. I've always been behind everybody and let the stars shine the way I wanted them to shine, not me necessarily. But my document, the documentary about me showed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And a writer came up to me, the woman who co-wrote my book with me, Amy Tofty, and she said, you need to write a book. And I said, I'm not a writer. She said, well, I am. She said, have you ever written anything before? And I told her about my journals and shared a couple of them with her. And she said, you're a writer. You are a writer. Write this book. And I said, if you'll do it with me, because I don't really know about structure and things like that, and I would appreciate you being by my side. 
And she said, okay. And so we started on a five-year venture and um, it took five years and it was first published a few years ago in French, but I was so unhappy with it because they translated in the translation so many idiosyncratic expressions and idioms uh, that we use uh, in English couldn't be used in French. They, they uh, couldn't uh, be translated. Yeah. So a lot of the humor was lost. You know, it, it, I, I was really disappointed in that. So it, it, they didn't really do too much to sell the book. So I asked for the rights back and got the rights back. And I was going to self-publish with Amy. And um, a publisher came to us and said, hey, I heard about this book you've got. Can I read a few chapters? And we sent him a few chapters. And he owned, um, owns Rare Bird Books in Los Angeles and loved it and said, I, wanted, I want to publish this. So it took us a year, reinventing the book, adding new chapters, changing kind of the structure of the book. Um, I really, I'm so happy with the book on many levels. Great. First of all, it's, it's filled with fun stories. You know, it's not a gossip rag. Yeah. It's about process. Uh, but that process includes all those intimate, wonderful exchanges that happen between myself and another artist in collaboration, whether it be Michael or Madonna or Bjork or directors like Steven Spielberg or Mike Nichols or whomever, you know, and fascinating stories I've found. And to talk about the process was important to me. So people know how things get done and how I approach a project, which might be a little bit different than others, but... Um, so I speak about both projects that I've directed theatrically, as well as projects I've choreographed and directed either for stage or short films or anything like that. But as well, Red, I, I'm happy with the book because, you know, oftentimes people see young artists, let me say, see people like myself who've had an incredibly amazing career, and they might think that it's easy that I got here easily. I didn't get here easily. It was, a, it was a struggle all the way, you know, and hard work and dedication and focus. And I talk about that. And I feel that the book is really inspirational for young artists, for young dancers, for young actors, for young choreographers, young directors, people who want to get into the business and talks about, you know, supporting them in terms of you have to stay focused and you have to believe in yourself. You're going to hear many more no's than you are yeses. So it's not easy for anybody, but if you stay true to yourself, yeah. if you listen to your instinct, mm -hmm. that's why I named it icons and instincts. Yeah. It's about paying attention to that voice that's inside. Mm -hmm. We all have this little voice inside of us that when we stop, when we slow down and not get frantic and not get panicked and just calm down and close our eyes and listen, that little voice tells us what's the true, what the true meaning of art is, I believe. And as an artist, if you can pay attention to that voice and listen to it when it tells you you're on the right path and when you're not on the right path, then I believe one can be better artist and constantly continue to grow and grow and grow and never feel that you stagnate yeah. if you keep listening to that little inner voice so that's what I hope the book does that's such great advice I mean that's so important now where can people buy your book and when will it be out well um it comes out on there were Pre-orders that came out early for early in August, but the but the real date, real pub date is September 13th of this year. And um, it will be available then um, on Amazon, Amazon International, um, so many different places. Um, uh, I think Barnes and Noble Books, I think uh, Walgreens in the United States, I think um, target in the maybe i don't know if you have targets in england um but it's called icons and instincts and the one other place and i'm gonna put my name up here but the one other place that people can find it is yeah. by my name vincent patterson official on facebook okay. and um i have an official page there 
And I also relate, um, I'll talk about this interview on there. And Thank uh, you. I'll put this on there when it comes out. Thank and you so much. Um, I'm keeping all kinds of fun things on that page. So Vincent Patterson Official is another place with one T. Uh, then uh, that's where people can buy the book. So That's excellent. So thanks again so, so much for uh, coming on the channel and doing this interview. It's been a true pleasure learning from you and hearing your stories. Aww. Other than the Facebook page, is there anywhere else where people can follow you or keep up to date with what you're doing? Uh, well, I'm on Instagram at VLPLA, um, which are my initials in Los Angeles, VLPLA. I'm on Instagram. That's my handle there. And uh, I don't have a website. I took it down. I'll probably put a website on again. But no, the Vincent Patterson official Facebook is kind of the most uh, inclusive of everything. Yeah. You know. Well, that's great. So thanks again so, so much. It's been- You're very welcome. Now, I hope you have best of luck with your book and I hope you have a great week. Thank you, Red. I really enjoyed this. I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I enjoyed listening to your other interviews as well. well and good luck with you. Good luck for you. I mean, I hope you continue with this and maybe become a great uh, talk show host, man. That means a lot. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.